morning. <laughs> Would you rather is a game that's often played between a group of friends. This is where one friend will introduce and a question and say, well, would you rather A, something they think is bad, and B, something that they think is even worse? Then it's up to you to make a decision and justify your answer. So today, I ask you, would you rather A, die early from a terminal illness, or B, live longer with a chronic disease but forget the people around you? As I mentioned, my name is Lisa Brown, and I'm a PhD student from the University of South Florida. Today, I hope to help you understand a little bit more and justify your answer, if you even have one and talk to you about commonly used antiretroviral ephedrines and the implications they may have on HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. HIV, as many of you know, infects the world a great deal. It actually infects 0.8% of the population worldwide, and that's about 35 million people. It's a virus that causes AIDS, and there's currently no cure. However, living with AIDS has drastically changed since the introduction of combination antiretroviral therapies, CART, or sometimes known as HART, introduced in 1996. In the pre-CART era, any individual that was diagnosed with HIV had a prognosis of death. This is despite the fact that ACT was introduced in the late 1980s as a monotherapy. In the post-CART era, however, HIV has moved from a terminal illness to a chronic disease, so you see people like Magic Johnson living for 20 plus years, and we expect to see more individuals living beyond the age of 50. Without getting into too much details on the HIV replication cycle, I would like to point out just a little bit about the inhibitors that are currently used as treatment. We have entry inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, and the focus of my project will be on the nukes and the non-nukes. These inhibitors actually work at the reverse transcriptase inhibition and when the HIV virus is actually already infused with the host cell and releases contents within the cytoplasm. Here is where HIV RNA is transcribed with reverse transcriptase into DNA. And this HIV DNA, they can migrate into the host genome in order to use its machinery to produce other HIV viruses. What many people tend to not know is that HIV causes something called neuro-AIDS. Neuro-AIDS is defined as any neurological condition occurring as a result of HIV infection. HIV is detected within the cerebral spinal fluid soon after infection. Even though it does not directly infect neurons, it can have indirect effects. However, it does infect other central nervous system cells, such as perivascular macrophages, microglia, and astrocytes. Even if they do not infect these cells, it can, in fact, lead to activation of these cells to secrete toxins and other cytokines and chemokines. Under this large umbrella of neuro-AIDS is the term HIV-Associated Neurocognitive Disorders, or HAND. HAND is then divided into three different types, from the mildest being asymptomatic to the most severe, HIV-associated dementia. They're normally differentiated by how much it actually interferes with daily living. Asymptomatic patients can go throughout their day not even knowing that they are diagnosed until they go through psychological testing. However, they have a heightened chance of developing more severe types. When you get to HIV-associated dementia, their daily life starts to be interrupted. So they start to forget to take the pills, they start to forget, forget the people around them, and their movements are also a little bit different. What's really key to note is that of all HIV patients, more than 40% of them are diagnosed with some form of hand. Hand is actually something relatively new in the HIV arena, as the introduction of CAR just recently started in 1996. A lot of the toxins and characteristics of HAND that have been looked at are several cytokines, chemokines, and viral proteins. However, in our lab, we'll focus on beta amyloid and reactive oxygen species. It's also very important to realize the difference that has occurred due to the introduction of HEART. In the pre-HEART era, most individuals were diagnosed with the most severe type of HAND. This was only correlated to the fact that they had high viral loads. However, in the post-HEART era, there is now, most of the time, undetectable viral loads. However, there is still a shift in more mild forms of hand diagnosis, and this phenomenon is still unexplained. This is where my research tends to try to find the gap between what is occurring with hand and HIV today. We focus on CART regimen, of which normally occurs with three types of drugs. They only have a baseline of two reverse transcriptase inhibitors in combination with another type, such as a protease inhibitor or an entry inhibitor. We focus on the first line of defense, which is normally prescribed to naive patients that have just been diagnosed with HIV and have not been on any treatments yet. This only includes two nukes, which is AZT and 3TC, 
and one non uni This is just a fat rinse. My, my focus will be a lot on the fat rinse as clinically it's shown a lot of symptomatic toxicities to the CNS, which includes hallucinations, headaches, and insomnia. Furthermore, while a lot of the nukes tend to be interchangeable with the new drugs that are coming out, uh, physicians still tend to prescribe a lot of the NNRTIs or the non nukes to be a fat rinse. As I mentioned, one part of our research is looking at A beta. A beta deposition has been shown in HIV patients, not only in postmortem tissues, but also in their CSF levels. In a study done by Rumpel and Pillian in 2005, they compared a control patient who was about 45 years old, HIV negative, and had no CS complications. Here, you see no indication of any A beta deposition. However, when you look at an HIV demented patient about the same age, you start to see A beta deposits here in their frontal cortex. This is in comparison to an AD patient here who is roughly 85 years old. As I described, A, a beta is a characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, as you saw in the patient earlier with, that was 85 years old. A beta is actually produced from the cleavage of APP protein or amyloid processing protein, first being cleaved by beta secretase and then gamma secretase. This leads to A beta being secreted and forming plaques. However, there are two pathways in which 90% of the time, APP is actually processed by alpha secretase and then gamma secretase, therefore leading to no A beta reduction. So we decided to look and see how these heart drugs actually have, any, if they have any implications on A beta species. Looking at in vitro model with neurons that overexpress Swedish APP as well as an APP overexpressing mouse model in vivo, we treated with 3TC, AZT, aphavans, and mixed, reg mixed regimen including all three drugs. Here, in vitro and in vivo, you start to see that the fabrics and the mixed therapy both significantly increase the amount of A beta species available um, to these, um, in these treatments. We then looked at a Western blot and looked at the comparison of SAPP alpha, which would indicate that normal processing of APP is occurring and A beta species, and showed that in correlation with the first the last experiment that A beta is actually increased with the fabrics and fabrics containing regimen in a similar correlation. Now that we understood that A beta was actually being increased, we decided to look at the mechanism behind it. As I mentioned, base one is that first touch of APP that leads to A beta processing. So we decided to look on how hard it affects base one. Base one, in correlation to the first experiments that showed A beta production, we saw similar results with the fabrics and fabrics containing regimen in vitro and in vivo that showed that there was an increase in base one, the enzyme that will start the cleavage. So now I'm showing you that not only is A beta increased, but also base one is increased at similar prolific rates. Another aspect of my research, as I mentioned, would be oxidative stress. If you look at just A beta in general and how it affects Alzheimer's disease, a lot of research have really connected increasing A beta to a decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential and a decrease in ATP, which can lead to neurons dying, as well as an increase in neurons of oxygen species. With this, a positive feedback loop then starts to happen where RRS increases base one, the enzyme that leads ATP and leads to A beta production, and increases A beta. As it relates to hand itself, there is high evidence of oxidative stress in HIV dementia patients in comparison to HIV negative patients, as well as in comparison to HIV positive patients that are not demented. There's also evidence that there's higher h and &E in postpartum tissues that indicates that there's possibility for great de uh, memory damage, as well as the great degradation of enzymes. Further, there are lower antioxidant, level, antioxidant levels within the neurons, such as glutathione, which is known to be neuroprotective. So we looked at how hearts can actually affect oxidative stress. We looked at mitochondrial dysfunction as well as reactive oxygen species. When treated with these N2A cells with the very same treatments, we saw that fabrins as well as the fabrins containing regimen decreased ATP levels and mitochondrial membrane potential. This indicating that that could also increase reactive oxygen species if you remember that cycle that I mentioned earlier. As expected, RRS was also significantly increased with the fabrins and the fabrins containing regimen. Overall, I've shown you that fabrins is one of the most toxic off the cart regimens of this naive first line. It increases A beta production, base one, and RRS, as well as it decreases mitochondrial membrane potential, ATP, and shifts APP processing from soluble ATP, which would be normal processing, to an abnormal processing to increase A beta. 
Further, we've shown that an aberrant containment regimen also had similar correlations, even though AZT and 3TC alone did not, and could possibly account for the mixed therapy having less of an effect. While it's important to understand that A beta itself is increased, it's also very important to understand if it's clear. In any normal individual, about 10% of the time, A beta is actually produced within your body. However, it's cleared rapidly through four different pathways. We'll look at microglia-mediated A beta clearance to see if there's any effect on these cartridges. In this term, microglia cells will actually phagocytize the A beta and clear it from your body. By treating primary mouse microglial cells with H50A beta, as well as heart regimen for 60 minutes, we'll look at the co of A beta with that of the, which is indicating green, with that of the microglial cells indicating with blue for the nuclei. The co will indicate the fact that these microglial cells are actually going to start clearing the A beta. When treated with the fabrins and the fabrins containing regimen, you see a significant decrease in the amount of co of A beta, which is indicating green, which you don't see a lot here when compared to control, 3TC, and ATT, as much as those co-localized um, above. So this indicates that the fabrins and the fabrins containing regimen actually does reduce A beta clearance as well. So I've shown you thus far that fabrins, cytopenine, and lobotene, or fabrins alone, decreases mitochondrial membrane potential and ATP stores, which increases reactive oxygen species. This then leads to base 1 increased activity and A beta phagocytosis decrease, which can overall lead to an increase in, species, in A beta species available in the brain. I hope so, thus far I have helped you to kind of think about that question I posed to you earlier of which you rather. You may not have an answer, but at least now you have a justification for what you have decided. But more importantly, this study has brought to our attention that commonly prescribed car drugs, such as the fabrins, may actually aid in enhanced pathology. Now, this is not to take away from the fact that HIV drugs are actually doing its job. Since its introduction in 1996 worldwide, the amount of HIV deaths has decreased dramatically. Just looking at this chart of US AIDS deaths, you can see from 1996 when it was introduced that HIV deaths have actually decreased more than 50%. It's also important to note that even though these viral loads and people are living longer, HIV drugs are not here protected. Furthermore, there is no effective treatment at this time for hand. So this gave leeway for individuals to start looking at different effective treatments that may supplement heart therapy. So not only will these drugs continue to do their job, but we're looking at elongating their lives and also by giving them a better quality of life. Furthermore, it also can hear youth therapy treatments for heart regimens that may not be neurodegenerative to, to have degenerative characteristics. Before I conclude, I'd like to thank my lab members, Dr. Brian Jinta, Dr. Jin, and James Bizzo, my committee members, and other support that I received throughout this project. Thank you, and I will now entertain any questions. <laughs> worldwide because of the cost. The fabulous has been around since 1998 and it's a little bit more cost effective. 
but they're trying to shift towards produce inhibitors at the time. But there's another um, individual that's in Penn State or UPenn, um, Dr. Shudo, who works on protease inhibitors, and they are all cell free to the brain. So they're trying to shift, but there's other things that they really need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yes? So there are other diseases that cause There are other, like Alzheimer's disease, they've actually done a clinical study with Memantine, which is used for Alzheimer's disease and blocking the NMDA receptor, but it wasn't as effective as well. Um, and it's not even effective in Alzheimer's disease, so it's kind of toxic in the air, and that's why they kind of are looking at different avenues and not just focus on like anti one avenue, they're trying to combine a lot of things such as antioxidants, whether it's the proteins, beta amyloid, tau phosphorylation. Um, they've seen um, correlations with Parkinson's disease as well, so they're really trying to draw from everywhere to really understand it a little bit more. Yes? So in, in Alzheimer's patients, like levels of beta amyloid, like the beta amyloid is actually correlated with cognitive function. Right. Um, the crime, so is that the case in hand patients? You see it earlier on, and it's as they progress, you actually see them develop it a little more, so it's more correlated with the beta amyloid on production than it is with Alzheimer's disease. So one of the differences between the two. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you think being a participant in the physician science training program prepared you for graduate school? I definitely think it did. It definitely could be above and beyond others <laughs> that have um, applied for graduate school, and especially just in my lab, when I present certain things to them, they, I, it comes from a different level of understanding. And um, it's just really set me apart. Every time I present my resume or talk to someone, it, it's almost like I put in the door every time. I've never been denied anything, so it's kind of, it kind of does.